We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. Medical problems are supposed to follow a set pattern. You go to the doctor with a set of symptoms, they do some tests, you're given medication, asked to make some lifestyle changes, or a surgical intervention is arranged. You get better, case closed. But what about the medical issues that seem to have no explanation, perhaps even baffle the experts? Dr. Sharon E. Martin graduated from John Hopkins School of Medicine and is a board-certified physician of internal medicine with a doctorate in physiology. Now, if anybody knows what's going on under the hood of the human body, it's her. But 18 years ago, she started to think there must be more to healing than what is in the Western medical toolkit. So she started to study energy healing, and in particular, shamanic medicine, practiced by indigenous people all over the world but still works as medical director of a rural health clinic in Pennsylvania, USA. Sharon has now combined the two very different strands of her training into a new book called Maximize Your Healing Power, Shamanic Healing Techniques to Overcome Your Health Challenges. So Sharon, what would the younger you, who loves scientific facts and certainty, make of you today and how you work? I think the younger me would be shocked at how I have learned through experience that medicine and science are not black and white. There are so many gray zones, and physicians with all of this compendium of knowledge still don't always know the answer. And it's one of the things, if I'm going to be a bit, what's the word, a bit jaded, I would say doctors perpetuated a great hoax starting 50-whatever years ago, that one, it was a top-down system, two, they held the secrets and no one else could have the secrets, and three, they knew it all, and all of those things are false. So I'm my younger me would be shocked and probably heartbroken. Well, thank goodness the younger you hasn't got to meet you today. So what was the tipping point that made you wonder if Western medicine was enough? Day to day in the grind when I first started out and trying to get people to do the right thing, right thing that medicine teaches to improve their sugars, their blood pressure, I realized that it didn't always improve their sense of well-being. There was a component, deep component missing, that it didn't always improve how they felt about themselves their vitality, their joy, their life force. And that was building. And then as I tell in my book, Maximize Your Healing Power, probably for me, the tipping point was this glorious young man who showed up the end of a week, a long, hard week, not a patient of mine who showed up with unbelievable anxiety that I was afraid he was going to be somebody that need to be involuntarily committed. I wasn't certain what kind of psychiatric swamp I was walking into. And he turned out to be one of the few people I've ever met who is unbelievably psychic, intuitive, perceives things around him. And he had dreams and daytime visions of things that were going to happen to people. And they came true and it made him unbelievably anxious and distressed. And I had a clarifying moment where I could have called the state police, had him transported under the guise of being schizophrenic or delusional or whatever. And I realized that there's nothing in medicine that could offer this young man other than a label in medicines that would make him feel worse. And I realized that we're talking about something very different that's not always valued in our society. His incredible 
extrasensory perception. And I told him, you're not crazy. But there was something inside you that actually stopped you. Can you sort of explain what was going on inside you at that sort of moment when you were about to reach for the police? I think at that time, what I was conscious of is that, you know, here's one of the gray zones. Medicine is not perfect. Why am I going to give him antipsychotics and sedatives? My mother, and here's perhaps the other thing. My mother was alcoholic and bipolar. And when she was on antipsychotics, it did nothing but dampen her love of life. And she hated it. So I think that was percolating and realizing I'm not going to do him any benefit. Then you add to it that I understood the unseen world at some level. I had had my own paranormal experiences. I believed in spirit guides. I believed in people living on the other side. And so that probably stopped me. But today, as I reflect back, what stopped me was spirit my soul in connection with spirit saying to me, hold up, you are not going to do him any good. And when I said to him, you are not crazy, the relief that I felt from him and that I saw on his face, it evoked joy in me that I did not harm him and that I actually let him see that he was not defective. And so you also spoke to his girlfriend as well, so that you really got a a deep understanding of what was going on, didn't you? Well, one of the key teachings in mainstream medicine is you don't just take a snapshot in time or one person's, especially in psychiatry, one person's statement. You need to get outside referencing data. And so I said to the girlfriend, is what he says true? Does he see things? because he could have been making this all up. I didn't know that. I sensed that he wasn't. And she said, oh, yes. His family has said since he was a child that he has the sight. They were a family descended from Romani gypsies. So I think there's a lot of factors that play in there. Is one, I was ready to see something different because I was fed up with the standard party line of mainstream medicine. I had a background in being open to the unseen world, and I had my soul, my higher self, my spirit guide, whatever you want to say, God, the universe, say to me, hold on, hold on here. So we've talked about something called shamanic healing techniques, and it's part of the title of your book. So talk us through, what are we talking about when you say shamanic healing techniques? We know it's interesting. Somebody asked me this the other day about what I thought shamanism was, and I am definitely not a purist. I am not strictly trained in one tradition. I don't drum or rattle. I have, but I don't usually. I don't take mushrooms or herbals to get into an altered state. So I'm not a purist. But for me, shamanic healing When you are a shaman, I think there are several key elements. I think these hold across cultures. You understand that humans are part of an interdependent web and that all animals and creatures and parts of the earth are connected. So that's one thing. You understand that there's an unseen world that we call spirit that the practitioner, the shaman, can connect with because that universal field provides information. The Amazonian shamans journeyed under influence of plant medicine and got information. So there's a universal information field that you can tap into. So you are the navigator, the negotiator between spirit and your client. And that, I believe, is true regardless of what culture you're talking about. If a few years ago we'd been having this conversation, there would be half of me thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I'm I'm sure there are going to be people who are listening to this are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me share an experience that I had. Before I moved to Berlin, I went to a festival of, and there were lots and lots of workshops. And a workshop I signed up for was something called Shamanic Journeys. Mm. And what you need to know at this point was that my mother had had a very all-encompassing stroke and was sort of lying somewhere between life and death in a coma at that point. 
And so how the workshop worked was we all lay down on yoga cushions, uh, on yoga mats, and the shaman drummed, and we were encouraged to visualize a tree, find a, a section in the visual tree, and we would go into the trunk and we'd either go up or down. And down is not to hell, but is to the underworld or mm-hmm. up into the, is it called the higher world or the upper world? Upper world. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I went up into the upper world and I can only describe it as sort of as real as in a dream, although I wasn't dreaming and you know I was on nothing beyond the hypnotic power of drum beats. Mm-hmm. But I was sitting around the bedside of my mother with all of the female relatives of my family and also my best friend who had never met, female best friend who'd never met any of my um, my family. And then behind them was the next generation back of uh, my grandmother mm-hmm. and my great-grandmother on my mother's side. And I could sort of see all the generations going back and behind them were sort of all living creatures, basically, but all living creatures in the Northern Hemisphere. So we had sort of bears, but no lions and tigers. And I saw the sky open and I saw my mother ascend to heaven, which, as you can imagine, was the most um, beautiful experience. And afterwards, I asked the shaman, you know, (laughs) what did I see? Is this... (laughs) Is this my is this my imagination? And he said he explained that shamans believe there is a hidden world. And then he also told me that I would get a message from my mother sometime in the future. And two things that further reinforce this message or this experience: when my mother actually did die, my best friend, this best female friend who I saw sitting around the bedside of my mother in the shamanic journey, was actually visiting me. She lives in Wales, or at that time I lived in England, she lived in Wales, so we didn't see each other very often. But by coincidence, she was there that weekend, and so we went to meet the rest of my family together. So in a sense, it did actually predict what happened. And the shame was right. I did get a message from my mother several months later, an oral message, like she said. So that's my experience. So one half of me is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one's saying, tell me more. Do you think a lot of people are torn in these two directions like I am? I think it's hard with our society being so science mechanistically based to step outside of that. But when you experience something as powerful as you did, you were in the transcendent state. You were, what I found also beautiful about your story is you were connecting with your lineage, all of your ancestors going back. That's very powerful. And I'll just digress a minute. You could take that memory and repeat that journey to that circle where your ancestors and beyond and beyond were, to then dialogue about how to clear or change anything in you that is ancestrally based. So there's there's a whole lot you could take from that. But to go back to your main question, how do we balance that? When you experience this transcendent you hope anyway, there are many people very strongly stuck in science is the only answer. But you transcend that understanding and your experience carries you into the mystery. There's no going back. When you have moments where you experience somebody, my sister and I used to go to psychics. And when you have a stranger who only now knows your first name, tell you things about yourself in the that are true and that are going to happen and do happen, you know that there's a universal field that people connect into. You can't ignore that kind of event. So in your book, you talk about going past your rational analytic mind on a training course and you needed to read stones. (laughs) Tell me what happened. Oh, that was a really powerful experience. So I'm in my shamanic training, which was with the Four Winds Society. And I don't remember what direction. We were probably 
doing the medicine wheel, the directions. So we had a week of one direction, then come back six months later, do the next direction. And it was probably the West. And we were to sit down with one of our classmates and read one of our personal stones that we had brought, read the stone for our classmate. And I sat down with this woman that I had never talked to. In fact, in class, we hadn't interacted yet. And I picked up one of my stones that was fairly nondescript. It did have one white streak through this gray stone. And I thought, how am I going to do this? This is crazy. (laughs) People are going to think I'm whacked. (laughs) But I, I did something that I think is important for anybody learning these things. Suspend disbelief. For that moment, suspend disbelief. So I rubbed the stone, put it on my third eye, and just allowed myself to enter some other state than my rational mind. And I started telling a story. You're on a boat in the ocean and that there's a storm and you fear you're going to capsize. And the storm is really bad. But look over here. You're moving out of the storm into the calm. And I'm thinking to myself, I am a crazy person. Well, she starts crying. <laughs> she starts crying. I said, did I upset you? What's the matter? Why are you crying? And she said, I had a dream last night that I was on a boat in a sea and I was going to capsize. And she said, my life has been really upheaval lately. It's I felt off kilter. I felt like I was going to drown, but I'm finally getting my bearings. And I said, well, the stone tells you you're going to be okay. That was so powerful for her because it confirmed she was moving out of the chaos, but powerful for me because When I entered that universal realm, I got information that was valuable to her. And later I looked at the stone and what I could clearly see originally during my what I told to her was the boat and the waves and the stormy side of the rock and the clear side of the rock. None of that was on the stone. I could not even make it up. I couldn't even find indentations to draw that. And yet I saw it so completely clearly. So when you suspend disbelief, so much is possible, so much is available. So you talk about helpers, natural spirits, power animals. What are you actually seeing when you're doing all this work? One of the biggest gifts studying shamanic and then other esoteric things has done for me is to help me know and believe that I'm not alone that there are forces in the unseen world that I can ally with and use as my helpers. And I call them helpers with a capital H. Every one of these, whether it's a nature spirit, a fairy, a power animal, a dragon, whether you're talking to the spirit of trees, this is an energy, a vibrational construct that you can interact with. And they feel different and they bring different qualities in terms of their energetic structure. But what's so incredible, I think, is that when you dialogue with these energies, I dialogue with what I call dragons all the time, creative forces of the earth. These are vibrational energies that I have called dragons. I give them a picture in my mind. I don't know that they actually look like that. Then you dialogue and you make relationships. And when you make relationships, you bring that quality of their powers to you for you to try on, join with your particular qualities. If you have a power animal of a jaguar, which I do, for me, I dialogued with it when I was at my very anxious, fearful times in life. There comes the energy of courage, of the ability to see in the dark of the ability to find the answer regardless. Like a jaguar can go in the forest and track and find prey. So those are qualities that I work with when I dialogue with that power animal. And that adds to my energetic assemblage, so to speak. So do you, in your rural Pennsylvania clinic, do you use these ideas with people who sort of walk in off the street? So that's tricky because 
I am operating in a medical legal system. I am charging insurance for their visit. So I don't engage in stuff completely that carries me outside of that realm too much. But what I have done is been able to say, and I always preface that I want to tell you something that is my spiritual belief. This is not science. It is not proven. But I am concerned you have a blockage in your life force. I am concerned that you need to take this issue to a fire and clear it. I say things like that, but I don't go full-blown shamanic. It's not the place for it, and it's not supported by the mainstream medical model, which has its limits, as everybody knows. And do you also see people outside the conventional medical model as well, where you would bring the other elements as well? Yes, I do shamanic work. Right now it's at a pause because of my book launch, so I've been too busy to do it. But that's on my website, drsharonmartin.com, drsharonmartin.com. And those sessions are done remotely because people who know about energy and energy medicine there is things that happen that do not require time and space. So is energy medicine and shamanism something different from each other? I think at the core, shamanism uses energy medicine. Energy medicine doesn't necessarily have all the animistic constructs that shamanic practitioners have. But I think at the core, it's about entering the universal field on behalf of your client and working within that. So so sort of give us an idea of how you work. Could you give us an example of a case so that we've got some sense of what you're up to? So would it be okay if we talk about the person you know that with the dental problems? Would this be a good time to do that? Yep. Okay. So let me first of all make a couple of explanations to people. So normally I use letters that have been sent in to me, but uh, I don't get letters that go into this field because I'm much more psychological. Whereas this is a sort of medical and I suppose spiritual type of issue. So I thought that as I'm aware that your approach generally is to go down the medical, biological, physiological field first. And when you get a blockage there, you then look at energy and shamanism. And so I thought, well, actually, I have something along these sort of kind of lines. And so the letter was written by me. And uh, we'll be looking at that letter in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So although this time round we're bringing in a letter from myself, if you would like to write in to me and uh, have me discuss an issue that's happening in your life with one of my experts from around the world, go to my website www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts where you'll find a section called Get Involved with the Programme. So this is letter from yours truly. I have a long and complicated relationship with dentists. I went through periods where I was dentally phobic, and even today I have to like and trust my dentist. Sadly, I've got to know a lot of dentists really well. Over the past 15 years, I have got six implants, and I can't count the number of times I've been told that something that happened to me is so rare to the point that most dentists see it once in a lifetime. I've broken the abatement on one implant. This is the section between the implant, which is in the jaw, and the crown, the tooth. I have also broken the screw that holds everything together and had to go to a specialist to get it removed. I've had another whole implant fall out because of an infection. I have broken a third implant, yes, the part in the jaw. I have had to have it taken out and a new one put in, and that, I can tell you, was horrible. A fourth one has a minor crack but is still being used in the hope it might survive a year or two. 
A fifth one is being looked into at the moment. Goodness knows what's happening there. My dentist, who gets cases referred to him from all over the city, sees something like this perhaps once or twice a year. But I have a whole catalogue of problems, and he has no explanation beyond that I might grind my teeth at night. Apparently, teeth move and can cope, but implants cannot. I now have a guard to put in at night, and I've become aware that I grit my teeth during the day and have to consciously unclench. I don't see myself as a particularly stressed person, busy certainly, but I enjoy my work and I don't have a boss breathing down my neck. I meditate for 20 minutes five times a week. However, there seems to be something more, something my dentist cannot name. Would some sort of energy healing be a good idea? So, what are your thoughts, Sharon? So, I'm going to bypass the medical and just tell you my thoughts, just rattle them off, and then tell you processes that I think you can do to get more clarity. One of my first thoughts is, let me back up and give you the background. Our energy field carries the imprints not only of interactions of this life, of, but of past lives. And there is something in a past life that affected your mouth, affected your teeth, that is still operating in this life. So I'll just keep throwing out the thoughts and then we'll talk about how to discern more. There is an intolerance to foreign material in your body. There is also an imbalance of the elements, and I mean that as earth, air, fire, and water. And one could argue on just on face value from an element point of view that your teeth are not stable, that perhaps they do not have enough earth element, or that there's too much earth and therefore they crack. And so how are we going to discern that? There are two processes that I teach in my book, but I use other examples that we could use here. The first is to, in a visualization, take yourself, I usually go and travel visually, whether you know it, feel it, see it, travel from behind my eyes where I'm looking, down inside, down into my chest, to the back of the heart, and find this very holy space called the sacred space of the heart. This was a process taught by Drunvalo Melchizedek, a mystic who worked with the Hopi. When you enter that sacred space of the heart, you are entering an energetic control room. You are entering a very sacred control center. Again, in your visualization, you can write this down and then record it and play it for yourself so you can follow along while you're able to release and go into that altered state. Sit in there and see yourself as the control person in this big control room with all of the dials and gauges on the dashboard that dial in your life. And you can pick one. Let's pick one, for example, the idea that your mouth cannot tolerate having these implants in, that it's breaking them, kicking them out, whatever. Go to that dial, tolerance for my implants, and dial up with your intention, watching the dial, visualizing, dial up to more tolerance. Perhaps there's a dial of less fragility of my teeth. There's a dial for strength, so dial up the strength. So the control room is a very powerful visualization process. I was taught by my uh, hypnotherapy teacher, Bren Blankenship, that control room engages your intention in a visual matter for then the physiology to follow. You don't have to know the physiology to turn the dial. The second is to sit again in the sacred space of your heart and have your tooth represented by, we'll call it the spirit of teeth, the head honcho of the tooth realm, whatever you want to call that. And however you see it, invite that energy into the sacred room, into sitting there in front of you and have a dialogue. Hello, 
head tooth. Hello, big honcho of the teeth realm. What is happening with my teeth? And listen to the answer you get. And you ask back again, why does this happen? And you'll get an answer. And then you'll ask back again, what do I do? And you'll get an answer. Well, does that mean I need to change my diet? Now, Andrew, for you, something I just that crossed my mind just now is these damages to your teeth happened years ago. They didn't happen right now. That's one thing. So you may have had a nutritional stressor, big nutritional stressor back at that time. In the dialogue, what can I do now to improve my gums, to improve the quality of my teeth, to keep the enamel from cracking? And you have that dialogue with this energy that represents the intelligence and wisdom of teeth. Do you actually see this tooth energy spirit in a clear picture, or is it something that's happening without a clear picture? I happen to be very visually oriented. So I'll make up a picture of what it looks like as it sits in front of me, but you don't have to see it. You can feel it, sense it, know it. You don't have to see. And how do you know this isn't all your vivid imagination? You're just actually sitting there saying to yourself, oh, you know, I need to eat more cheese sort of kind of thing. When you're in a meditative state, first of all, you're engaging your subconscious and your higher self. So even if you're, quote, making up the picture that you see, the intention and the wisdom you're accessing are of higher nature. So do you actually hear words or is it a case that you sort of know them inside yourself? For people in general, it doesn't matter if they hear or not. I get a a knowing It's as if I heard, but I don't actually hear a knowing, usually on the left side of my head. And I can get a picture of words that travel across the front, but every person is different. Every person's right brain, as it enters the transcendent realm, gets messages in a different way. And you mentioned something about past lives causing something with teeth. (laughs) Tell me more about that idea. I haven't dived in deep enough to pull out the pieces for you. But knowing, shamanically knowing that past life energy imprints your current energy field, that you carry with you the lineage of your past lives and your biologic lives, I had an intuition that something is playing out here in this lifetime because of something that happened in a past life for you and that you could discern that, again, sitting in the sacred space of the heart, asking a wise being to come forward to explain it to you, You something like that. So is there an exercise that we could do together today that would sort of help us understand this whole concept better? Shall we journey to the sacred space of the heart? Well, that sounds like a, a really good idea. What do we have to do? So for the listeners, just formulate in your mind something you want to know the answer to, something that's been bugging you. And then let's just start with some nice, easy breaths, in with the nose, out with the mouth. And just allow yourself with your eyes closed to enter that altered state that light trance state. Just allow your breath to carry you deeper below the noise of your human mind. Just allow it to carry you deeper. And follow my voice, whether you see it or feel it or know it. Just take your awareness from where it was looking out the back of your eyes and carry that through the inside of your head, down. Let's move on down past your mouth, down your throat, and enter your chest 
and find yourself on the backside of the heart in the center of your chest. And you will know this or see this or feel it. Find yourself entering that tiny sacred space of the heart. And you'll know where it is. You'll know it. You'll feel it. You'll sense it. Go ahead and enter in that sacred space. And enter in, and this will open up to a room. And I want you to be aware of the room. And I want you to look around and see how it's furnished, what makes it comfortable, see what the walls are made of. And sit yourself down, whether you're in a comfortable chair, on a couch, a pillow. Make yourself comfortable in this sacred space of your heart. And just feel that you're in this place where all your worries have gone. Everything has slipped away. And you know that you're ready to receive important information. And you know that you're ready to hear a message, something you may not have been aware of before. And as you're sitting there in this comfortable space, sacred space of your heart, invite the wise being that knows all about you Invite that being in, whether that's your guardian angel, a spirit guide, your higher self. This is the wise being that knows about your life. And just see the door in the room open and feel this being enter and take a seat in front of you. And just relax. You are in the presence of wisdom. You are in the presence of mastery. And in your mind's eye, first thank the being for coming. And then ask what it is you want to know. In your mind's eye, ask this being what it is that you want to understand. And let's just take a few moments for you to get the message back. And if you need clarification, to ask another question. And take these messages in, however they come to you. You're in dialogue with the wise being of you. And your messages may just be colors or feelings or senses. Doesn't matter. Take what you get. If you don't quite understand, ask for clarity. And if you're told, I can't tell you now, don't be upset. You can come back here again and try again. Sometimes messages may not be available at this moment. And let's get ready to finish up any last things you want to know. And in every powerful altered state meditation or shamanic practice, you always end with gratitude and appreciation for the beings that share their wisdom with you. 
So allow the being to take its leave and you journey back out of the sacred space of your heart, up out of your chest, up through your neck, until your awareness resides again behind your eyes and bring yourself back to this time and this space and come back now. Well, that was absolutely beautiful, Sharon. Thank you very much indeed. I went to did you used to watch the original Star Trek um, yes, television yes. program with, you know, Captain Kirk mm-hmm, and co? Mm-hmm. It sort of, <laughs> I sort of went there and sort of all that sort of 60s stroke 70s high tech glory mm-hmm. sort of. And then, uh, you know, how they used to have the sliding doors. I had sliding doors and I have a relationship with wolves and I had a wolf materialize. And so the message I got was, you don't have to bite to defend yourself. Mm, that's beautiful. So I'm not quite certain what that means. Well, isn't it interesting? We were talking about teeth and you say bite. Well, I did ask, you know, the question, my question I went there is, you know, why I'm having problems with my teeth. So that was what I was asking for. But wolves do have wonderful teeth. Well, here's another thought. Is your tooth grinding a subconscious way of stealing yourself, S-T-E-E-L, stealing yourself to move into the future? In other words, is it a gritting down for grit your teeth and move on? So don't have to bite to defend yourself. You don't have to grit your teeth in order to steal yourself to make it into the next day. That's a beautiful thought. Thank you very much for for that. And Wolf is, there's more about, I know you have a relationship with Wolf, but having Wolf show up now adds to the power of this because wolves are great protectors. So this to me is talking about You have protection outside of having to steal yourself to grit. We are here. We are your protectors. You can relax. As the wolf said, I don't need to defend myself either because I'm imagining all of these enemies or because they're here to protect me. Both. So... I think you've given us a pretty good idea of how it works. I have to say as well, there's a, an idea in the book about soul contracts, which is the contract you've made with the world and going back and rewriting it. You know, I actually had a client who said to me they were fed up with, you know, they unconsciously did a deal with their parents, you know, when they were very small to to do this for their parents and they were fed up with doing it. And I thought, I know. Uh, I know from uh, Sharon's book, A Journey, that we could go on. And I did that and it was very, very powerful. So um, I did try out another idea in the book. So um, I can recommend that one too, which is where you go, A Journey to the Hall of Contracts. So you've certainly expanded my mind today. Andrew, I have another thought for you. Yes. Did you make a contract in a past life to be the guardian or the protector to take on that role. And it's translated into this life as you uh, having to grit and bear it. Well, I come from a family that have been doing generations of grit and bear it, to be perfectly honest. You know, my whole family have belonged to the talk nothing about your emotions, just get on with it. And as you can possibly gather, I'm a bit of a rebel for as far as that's concerned, because I, I spend my whole life talking about feelings and emotions. So, you know, that was the family contract. I don't, I might have signed it at one point, but I tore the contract up a very long time ago, but somehow I don't think it's reached my teeth yet. You might do that journey for yourself because there might be a residual of you needing to grit and move on that is still acting in this lifetime. Okay. Well, as I say, you've expanded our minds today. 
I I have to thank you for being a witness on The Meaningful Life. And I have to ask you the question, what makes your life meaningful? Everything I've learned since studying these energies, shamanic energy and expanding now into knowing more about consciousness, it has given me a richness and a deeper understanding of our interdependence and a deeper commitment to stewardship of the earth and animals. And that fills me up. That feels good and it feels rich and vibrant and I love it. So this, unfortunately, is where we have to finish for most people. But if you become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, then the conversation continues. And we're going to be talking about how to break bad habits and start new ones. Because let's face it, when it comes to our health, there are a lot of things we do on a regular basis that don't help. We know it, but we can't break out of them. So I think it's going to be very interesting to talk to Sharon about that. If you want to hear this bonus material, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock all the multitude of benefits and hear this bonus material, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you. <laughs>